Welcome again to GPS, our very special Zoom edition. <laughs> and uh, we've been talking about Revelation 12 and uh, our big prophetic surprise the last time was that there are times when atonement isn't enough. And we realized that the whole concept of the cross and the atonement was way bigger, maybe, uh, than most people who read the Bible uh, would have noticed before. So for me, that was a pretty exciting uh, prophetic surprise. But as we get started today, I'm just curious, Viana, how did you get into the book of Revelation? What, what made it interesting to you? Um, it was definitely not on my radar to get into Revelation. And I started reading John, the Gospel of John, and there was something about that compelling message in the Gospel of John that I said, if this is the guy who wrote Revelation, there surely has to be a literal God prophetic surprise waiting in there for me. And um, so I felt very confident. I opened up Revelation and there was a scholar from Andrews. I don't remember his name, but he said, no, friend, like you're not going to be able to get through Revelation unless you really understand Old Testament symbolism and language. And I was like, no, I just got through the Gospel of John. Like, I can definitely get through Revelation. And so I opened up Revelation. I realized he was right, <laughs> that I wasn't going to be able to plow through this um, just by having read the Gospel of John. And I closed it back up and I never really got back into it again. It was just uncompelling. I don't know what that accurate word is, but it was not compelling until John Pauline invited me to be on the panel. And I had to revisit these fears and biases. And so I just took God's hand and I said, we're going to walk through this together because I know that you put in my heart that there was a beautiful message in Revelation, just like the one I had found in the Gospel of John. And we're going to discover that together. So it definitely has been a lot of GPSs for me, um, having come back to the uh, book of Revelation. And that was the reason I, I invited you to join the program. You know, uh, it wasn't just about a bunch of experts getting together, but but to say, hey, we, we can learn together. Uh, there's there's a, there's a perspective that you're going to bring that the rest of us maybe wouldn't bring, mm -hmm. and uh, so that that very perspective that you brought has has been refreshing, exciting, and as I've sometimes mentioned, if we can get you just a little bit upset, you get really cooking. <laughs> so we'll work on that in today's Thank show. You. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Nick, uh, why don't you read the text and we'll start. Let's go with verses 12 and 13. And I think we'll discover here, Viana, uh, in the text we're going to look at today, the importance of the Old Testament, exactly what you were saying, mm -hmm. uh, will become evident when we get in here. Okay, Nick. All right. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. All right. So in verse 13, we're connecting back with verses 5 and 6. In verses 5 and 6, you had a baby born, a male child. Uh, the dragon was threatening the male child, threatening the woman, but the male child was snatched up to heaven and the woman flees into the desert. Uh, so here uh, you're picking up on that story. The dragon has gone to heaven for a while. A war has happened there and he is cast down uh, because of the cross, as we saw in the last program. So here we see in, uh, in verse uh, 12, that heaven is to rejoice uh, because uh, the devil has been cast out, but the earth and sea are in trouble because he's come down. Now notice something there. It says the devil has come down to you with great wrath. And uh, I think we raised the question a few programs ago. Uh, was the devil thrown out violently or did he leave voluntarily? And the Greek language is about 50-50.
there's two or three places in chapter 12 where, where he's the object of casting down, but there's two or three places where he's the subject of leaving, of coming down. And, and that's what you see uh, in chapter 12 and, and verse 12. So uh, perhaps uh, there's a little bit of both uh, involved, but he's cast down spiritually in the sense that because of the cross, nobody in heaven's taking him seriously. And if you're living in a place where no one's taking you seriously, you usually try to find a better location. Mm. And uh, so in part, at least, uh, that's probably uh, what uh, he had done. So in heaven, this victory is assured, and yet it's not absolutely certain just yet. There's still peril, particularly here on earth. All right. Now notice in verse 13, it says the dragon was cast down to earth. There's another one. He was thrown down. So there's a passive. Just had an active. Now you have a passive. That connects with verses 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. And in verses 9 and 10, he is cast down. So you can see this is all connected. Revelation 12 is all connected. Uh, the dragon threatens the woman. A uh, male child goes to heaven. Woman goes out in the desert. Dragon follows the male child to heaven. War takes place. He loses. He's cast down. We're back to where we were before. Now he's chasing the woman again. So this is all a continuous narrative uh, utilizing both heaven and earth. So probably some of our viewers are wondering, wait a minute. Wasn't the casting out of Satan back in the beginning, before creation, why would there be casting down here in the context of the cross, in the context of the ascension of Jesus Christ, in the context of his being enthroned in heaven? And we did, we did touch a little bit on that a couple mm -hmm. of shows ago. Um, how really, I remember some of our analogies, you know, a family affair, you know, a member of the family walks out and, and, but still has the keys, you know, mm -hmm. the locks haven't changed, but then something at the cross happens. Cause that's what we're talking about in revelation chapter 12. And I don't know if the analogy, I don't know if we completed the analogy and explicitly said something like this, but it, could it be that the cross is kind of where the locks are changed? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I never, never put it that way before. That is so cool. Yeah. It's an analogy. I mean, metaphors, you know, that's what, what we're dealing with trying to talk about heavenly things, but yeah, it's, it's like he left and the, the locks got changed. Mm -hmm. I like that very much. All right. So, so you have this continuous narrative and uh, originally, you could say then that he was cast out, but the locks weren't changed. He did have visiting privileges and, and did show up uh, from time to time. But then we get to verse 14. And Nick, would you kindly read that for us as well? Sure thing. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Hmm. Who's the serpent? Satan. But I thought he was the dragon. <laughs> interesting. That is also like Genesis 3 here. Right. Mm -hmm. So here you have an interesting thing. It, it, it's the, the dragon comes down. The dragon is persecuting the woman but you get to verse 14 and there's no dragon. Instead, you have the serpent. Hmm. And then you get the dragon again in verse 16. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you have the serpent in 15 and then the dragon comes back in 16 and 17. Hmm. So what's going on there? A prophetic surprise. <laughs> okay. What, what would that be? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. I like that response, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ponder. 
Um, what, you know, something that comes to my mind is um, the imagery of what each represents in terms of power and destruction. And oh. so when I think of snake, right, I think of the Garden of Eve, Eden, where it's the deceiver. It's very sly and cunning and, and can kind of slide into your thoughts and oh. temptations. And then when I think of dragon, it's this claws out aggressive like completely overwhelming you don't um, forget the fire by force <laughs> um yeah it's more of a forceful thing than it is you know the power of words um but they're both doing the same thing they're both attributes to satan hmm. i'm so excited about that that is that is a great insight and i'll tell you where, where it's hitting me is in revelation 13 uh, the beasts use two methods, intimidation and deception. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I just kind of made that connection, Viana, as you were talking. Wow. You got, uh, you know, you have the snake and the dragon. The dragon, ferocious, forceful, scary. Yeah. The snake, that well, can be scary to some people, but you can get away from a snake. I mean, it's not it's not going to be able to chase you down in most cases. Uh, but but the snake, the big the big concern is the mouth, you know, and 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 what will happen there. And the serpent, of course, goes back to uh, I think you were saying Shifra Genesis three, mm -hmm. and the serpent there didn't bite anyone, didn't threaten anyone, simply said, you know. Maybe things aren't quite the way you've been told, mm -hmm. and and that was deceptive speech. So, so the serpent in chapter twelve seems to represent deceptive speech, and the dragon perhaps representing the force. It's mm -hmm. like there's this overt form and this covert form. Mm -hmm. And it it makes me think of like good cop, bad cop, right? And uh, it also makes me think of um, Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. He didn't come, you know, as someone trying to control him with power, like guns blazing or anything, but he's trying to invite him into an easier way. He's like, this will make you look good. This will feed you. This, you know, there's an easier way um, using that uh, seductive speech. So, yeah, this is very intriguing. And yet here we see them so side by side, literally words apart, mm -hmm. that what I'm thinking is that he's using every single aspect of his you know, self to try and attack and deceive, take over the world. He's already bitter that he no longer has keys to heaven, that his power has been broken at the cross. And now he's like, all right, I'm just going to all in. I'm all in um, with the destruction. Mm. Oh. I was just thinking, you, you brought up this good cop, bad cop thing, Nick. Uh, have you ever thought of God in that way? You know, like there's this scary Old Testament God, and then there's Jesus. Is, is there a divine counterpart to the dragon and the serpent? Hmm. Oh, I was kind of thinking about that, but Nick, go ahead. It was a no, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'll tag in if you want to tag me in. Go ahead. And then, okay, boom. Um, I was thinking about that because it connects to our last show where there was something that was just not, it was inadequate to explain why did Jesus die or why did Jesus have to die? And I think if I were tracking correctly, if I had tracked correctly, there was you're, you're, there's these two levels of salvation. It's like interpersonal, but then there's the cosmic um, story. And, and this is where Revelation 12 comes in. So I'm wondering if that's the divine counterpart or if that's the salvation solution, if you will, or if, I don't know if salvation is the correct word, but sin is not just an interpersonal problem. It's a cosmic universal problem right? Systemic problem. So the solution to the sin problem has to be one that can address the problem on every level. So we have the presence of say, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was, I was just thinking, you know, I, I thought of the counterpart, um, but it's not that God is, is 
you know, real positive and sweet sometimes, and sometimes he's mean, like it's all just like Satan is all for the same goal of destruction. Mm -hmm. um, God is the lion and the lamb, right? This comes from Revelation that he is both the 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 king who who conquers, but he's the sacrificial lamb who wins not through force, but through surrender um, and looking like allowing himself to look like a loser on the cross. But that is the ultimate sign of victory uh, for Christians now, because we know that he he won through that sacrifice. So he does have, there is kind of a counterpart where it, there's the strong Jesus and the appearing the weak Jesus, um, the lion and the lamb, but they're both strong and powerful um, manifestations of God's character. Like that, like that very much. Good job. That, that, that's really expanding our, our, our thinking here. Um, that's good. When you come back, though, see, here's the thing that challenged me with the good cop, bad cop view of God is going into the Old Testament and seeing amazing passages like Exodus 34, where you know God is merciful and gracious to thousands of generations. Yes, he, he uh, will not clear the guilty, but visits their sins for the third and fourth generation. But compare that with a thousand generations, and you realize that even when God is judging, it is so minuscule compared to his mercy. Uh, that, that, that's an amazing thing. And then in the New Testament, you've got the third angel's message in Revelation 14, which we're going to get to here sometime soon. And, and in that, you have some of the most horrific uh, judgment language you'll find uh, anywhere in the Old Testament. So the idea that there's an Old Testament God and New Testament God is, is a myth that has been perpetrated for a long time. God is infinitely powerful, but he's equally gracious and he exhibits his power in restraint. Um, the, the ability to restrain power is far more impressive mm. than the ability to exercise it. Right. I remember a time I, I, was, uh, I was writing a book, and, and so a friend of mine graciously allowed me to stay with him so I could get away from, uh, uh, from distractions for a couple of weeks and, and, and write this book. And he, he was president of a golf course and uh, lived right on the golf course. And so we got to go out pretty much every morning. And he had a bunch of hard drinking, hard swearing friends <clears throat> that he had been working with, shall we say, you know, <laughs> through the years trying to better their lives. And uh, I, I, I noticed, you know, I remember one guy, he hit, hit a ball out of a trap with all of his might, there's this low line drive and there was a rake laying on the grass just on the other side of the trap. The ball hits the rake and stops dead. And he lets out a string of expletives. And, and my friend just calls over, oh, he says, uh, what sort of rake did you say that was? <laughs> and, and it just, you know, sorry, I forgot, you know. And, and so he, you know, he had this influence. Well, I remember one day, it was 17th hole and one of these guys was, had a ball that was a little bit dug into the grass. And he took this mighty swing and knocked the ball deeper into the ground. Thanks. And we waited and there was silence. <laughs> he just went up, took another swing and drove it deeper into the ground. And we waited and there was silence. And finally on the third swing, he got the ball out and heading in the direction he wanted to go. But I remember when it was over and we were leaving uh, the other ones, you know, with whatever they were drinking. As we were walking out, I said, Doc, I said, um, give me a minute. I, I want to go make a play for Dick's soul. And I went back in. I just put my hand on his shoulder and I said, it takes a really, really big man to do what you did on 17 and not let out a string of profanity. I said, I am really deeply impressed. I just wanted you to know that. And just, you know, walked away and left. And it, it, that taught me that it's in restraint that power is made complete. Mm. Uh, the person who's powerful but is just spraying it in all directions is, is out of control. But it is, it is power that is there, but it is controlled that counts. And you see that in sports. 
People can be very strong and very fast, but if they can't control it, it doesn't make the team better. You could have the fastest guy in the world, but he'll never be a wide receiver because he doesn't control the speed. Mm. And he doesn't control his hands and, and his body in such a way to actually contribute to the game. So what we see in God is, is infinitely powerful, but uh, he exercises that power under control and uh, with, with extreme grace. And so the good cop, bad cop, there's, there's truth in that with God. And I love the lion lamb uh, analogy. Uh, but if that is the case, you find it in both the New Testament and the Old. It's not a, not a wall between the Testaments. Love so, that. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Uh, you guys have really been, uh, been cooking on this today. Uh, so 14. Can I just circle really quickly? Oh, absolutely. Real quick, I did, I'm not sure how much time we have, but just to the lion and the lamb and the power dynamics, I think it's so relevant to today's questions. Nick, you brought it up about social justice and things that are going on in our country, but also world. And I love that God is a lion because when you need to be protected, defended, you need that divine counterpart that is able to go before you as the lion, the lion of Judah, right? That glorious almighty God. But when you need someone to be able to empathize and suffer with you, we have God as a lamb who was slain, right? To death and and by his blood, we are saved. You know, all of that is just so wonderful when you need someone to have that gentle touch. So depending on where you are in the hegemonics of life, you know, places where we're privileged, places where we're empowered, but places where we're not empowered and we're in need of a savior, right? God comes in and like addresses our needs on every level. It's a, it makes me just want to say, thank mm -hmm. you, God. What a wonderful God and take a praise break. So I just thought I <laughs> awesome. Uh, very, very good. Um, Nick, why don't you pick up your Bible again? And we just read verse 14, but what I'd like you to do is read verse 6 and verse 14 back to back, because I want our audience to see how similar these two verses are. So first right. uh, Revelation 12, 6, and then Revelation 12, 14. Okay, so here's verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And then verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. All right, if you'd all just keep those two verses in front of you uh, to the degree that you can, I want to point out some interesting things. First of all, you have a woman in verse 6 and a woman in verse 14. Same word in the Greek. Uh, the Greek has other words for, for woman, but uh, this is the same one. And uh, the you have a desert, number two. Desert in both places, exactly the same Greek word. And then there's the word place. Uh, she had a place prepared by God, verse 6. Uh, she came to her place, verse 14, same Greek word. And then the purpose was to be nourished, to be fed, to be taken care of uh, for a period of time. Uh, that's number four. Wow. And then the period of time. You have 1,260 days. You have time, times, and half a time. And we understand the time, times, and half a time to be the same as the 1,260 days. Three and a half years is roughly uh, 1,260 days. So you have her nourished for a time. But there's one interesting difference. And uh, I only saw this for the first time this morning. So this is not in my commentary or anything else like that. Uh, but it just really struck me as I took a careful look. In verse 6, it says that she went to the place prepared by God in order that they might feed her. It's third person plural. 
they might feed her. I think the King James actually does that. I'm not sure any of the other translations do that, reflecting what is actually in the Greek text. Who's the they? Hmm. I don't know. Angels? Um, uh, let's see. You, uh, you have the woman fleeing to the desert. There's a place prepared by God in order that they... Hmm. What could that be? Who's I the they? Elohim is plural, if I'm correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, Trefosen here is plural. So it's, it's, it's they, third person plural, feed her. The thought came to me. Hmm. I don't know if this will fly, <laughs> but I, I just saw this for the first time. So I, just, I said, is that an allusion to Elijah? Mm. Elijah spent three and a half years in a hideaway, and they fed him. Who were they? Ravens. Ravens. Yeah, we got lots of them in my neighborhood. Uh, the, those black, big black birds uh, with the shrieky voices, etc. They'd bring him food. And so I think we probably have a sneak illusion here that maybe no one has noticed. I'm going to have to check a few commentaries, see if anybody's noticed that. But they feed her. They might feed her. And then in verse 14, it's a singular passive. She might be nourished or might be fed. Now, that's not a huge spiritual difference here, perhaps. But I just find it exciting uh, to notice uh, that subtle, subtle difference. But you also have the two bird, uh, if, if that's kind of where you're going to in the they with Elijah, um, in verse 14, you have wings of an eagle. And, and I know that's kind of going on a limb, but if this verse is so, so tied in uh, together, verse 6 and uh, verse 14, you do have a bird imagery there. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Let's see, which one is it in here? I've got my Greek text here, so it may take me a little longer than you to find it. But where's the eagle? It's in uh, the... the uh, given the two wings of the great eagle, verse 14. Oh, yeah, verse 14. Okay, so is... Oh, I love this. Is it possible, then, that the they is the two wings? What are the two wings? <laughs> <laughs> How is this relevant to the message? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps not directly, but uh, it, I think the more that we can get into the original mindset, the people who first got this, uh, the more likely we are to see what God is, is really trying to, to get to us in this passage. Well, just summing up here, because we have just a little few seconds left, uh, these two verses are parallel and they each have a time piece. And what we'll get into in our next program is what do these times mean? Time, times, and half a time, 1260 days. What is going on there? And that will be a prophetic surprise as well. So for all of us here at GPS, we'll see you again next time.